Hello there, everyone. Welcome to episode number 625 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. Biomanufacturing takes center stage in this week's podcast. My guest is Bert Verbruggen from IMEC, and Bert and I are exploring the challenges of bioengineering and how inline production process monitoring can help solve these issues. Bert and I also discuss new developments that IMEC is pursuing for inline sensors and the role that artificial intelligence can play in these systems. So without further ado, please welcome Bert to Fish Fry. Hi, Bert. Thank you so much for joining me. A pleasure to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about how we can harness the power of technology and human expertise to transform biomanufacturing. But first, Bert, talk to me about the challenges of biomanufacturing, which includes the biological production of human cells for stem cell therapy, right? Yeah, that's correct. It doesn't include much more, actually. It can go from vaccines, hormones, antibodies, if we stick to the pharmaceuticals, But technically speaking, biomanufacturing also includes enzymes that you find in your washing products or the production of beer or yogurt. Not to make this too complicated, we'll stick to the pharmaceuticals, where there are indeed quite some challenges still. Maybe surprisingly, there is a lot of dark, as they call it, black box in these processes, things that we don't really know how it works. Because these biological cells that are producing the pharmaceuticals are inherently, surprisingly variable, which means that the quality of the product, the quantity of the product is difficult to predict or difficult to control. And even in very large production facilities controlled by experts, by big pharmaceutical companies, Just to give an example, they tend to throw away up to 10% of the produce because the batch has failed or because there is some uncertainty about the quality. The quality of the end product is pretty much guaranteed, but actually the quality of the process to make it is truly not understood in all its detail. And that is giving, if you think about bigger products, vaccines like the next flu vaccines, that's basically a cost problem. But in other, especially newer processes, such as the one you mentioned about cell therapy or about CAR-T therapies, it's people dying. That's the problem because the produce, if the batch fails, it means that somebody who is stage four cancer is not being able to be treated in time. So there a cost problem suddenly becomes an ethical problem or an ethical question about how can we guarantee quality in the production? How can we guarantee a minimal delivery of cells at the end of the process. All right. So can we look at inline production process monitoring? Now, this can help with this process, right? So talk to me about the role that inline sensors can play here. When I say that the problems occur from issues of not understanding or not being able to predict the behavior of the cells, what we need is better eyes, better sensors to look at the process. These inline sensors can provide better eyes than the alternatives we have today to gain these insights to better understand what's happening. Real-time sensors or inline process monitoring is actually a way to get way more data throughout the entire process instead of having occasional samples throughout the process. So as I mentioned, in first instance, that will give us ways to gain the insights to better understand the process. It's not a guarantee in itself, but it finally gives us the tools to understand the whole process better. But secondly, also, it gives us data that is actionable. Instead of giving at the end of the process quality data that says that a certain process has failed, if we see that a process is about to fail or the trends are going in the wrong way, we might still have an opportunity to push it back on track and to save the batch or even optimize each individual production process to the limit. 
because we get this data every second and we see the trend lines, we can push it in the direction we want. And then ultimately, as a far dream, if we have all this data of the entire process of all the parameters, maybe we can guarantee the quality just like that at the end, because we know the process followed the track we wanted it to follow. And we know that in all the details, we might be able to do what is called real-time release of the product instead of waiting days, sometimes weeks for the lab to give the final batch release um, data. We can actually release it immediately, which would lead to significant savings of storage and, and so on in the pharmaceutical production. So talk to me about the new developments that IMEC is pursuing for inline sensors and the benefits that these sensors can play for these kinds of applications. IMEC is working on sensors in general in multiple domains and on inline sensors specifically, of course. We work on new sensor types, so new ways to measure anything in liquid, basically, which can range from new ways to, to monitor the density of the cells, the number of the cells, or the size of the cells that are in the production. We're also working on alternative ways to measure protein titer or some other things that are of crucial importance in these uh, biomanufacturing. Next to that, in not just specific sensors, we're also working on different sensor platforms, which means different ways to make the sensors where we tend to focus on longer term stability, to lower the cost, to allow for better manufacturing uh, strategies later on, and basically tune these sensors for a biomanufacturing market. We're also working on system level integration, so actually beyond the core of iMac, beyond the chip, where we're thinking about combining multiple sensors, uh, integrating them on a system level, building demonstrators that can be used by pharma companies in their research labs, introducing AI, working on sterility, and actually trying to push our chip into the real world as much as possible to make sure that we know how it works and that we know how to help our partners to make it functional in their environment. Okay, so let's also talk about the role that AI can play here. How can AI help with the incredible process complexity here? AI can actually help on many different levels, and we should not mix those. AI can help with the design of the sensors already. It can help with analyzing the data that comes from uh, such sensors, basically reducing the noise, cleaning up the signal. It can also combine data from different sensors together to generate new signals. And it can help us, which is, I guess, for me personally, the most critical aspect, it can help us get these insights that we're lacking by looking at the data, by combining the measured data with the knowledge we do have about these processes, we actually can complete the picture. AI can predict certain aspects, certain processes that we are lacking and help us complete the entire picture. Ultimately, as I mentioned before, with the real-time release, an ultimate dream here is that AI can help, maybe comparable to a self-driving car, just look at the sensor data, immediately make decisions on adjustments that need to be made real time so that each and every process, each bioreactor is driven to the most optimal direction for the most optimal results. In some cases, that is yield from a cost perspective. In other cases, that will be avoiding failure. Or in the case of CAR-T and, and, and other personalized medicine, that could be about faster production or being able to stop the production once the yield is high enough so that the patient can be helped as soon as possible. Explainable AI is an important component here. So talk to me about that aspect. Today, our knowledge of the bioprocesses that are happening is expressed in, let's call it, mathematical formulas. And those can be high level, has to do with mixing speed, volumes, the transfer rate of what you feed to the cells, to the produce they make. Or it is about some certain specific biological pathways, which can also be expressed in a rather graphical way and a, or a mathematical way. So it can be explained to people. 
you might need some background and some knowledge, but it is a language that we as humans speak. AI can help us then making and explaining in mathematical terms or in, in pathway terms, what is happening, what it sees, quote unquote, in the data so that we can apply it to different processes without fully retraining the AI. And if we then change a process and we know that we're replacing the number of cells or something, we might be able to change that in the AI and get to an updated process with an updated AI in one step without starting over. The second aspect has to do with the regulation. Normally, in the old school days, a process is frozen. And that means that you every time have to do the same thing in order to produce a quality product. With AI, what we want to do is actually tweak each new process. Every time you run the process, there might be small tweaks in the process. And from the regulatory point of view, that is difficult to handle. They're open to it, but it's difficult. If we then come and say that there is an AI that is working as a black box that will change the process however it deems best without actually telling us why or without we understanding as humans what's happening, that'll be a very tough thing to do for the regulator, for the FDA. Whereas if we can explain in human understandable language how the process is running and what is different between the previous process and this process and thus why we are tweaking the control, that will be much easier for experts, for the FDA to accept as a reasoning behind those changes. Okay, now this technology is just one part of a larger focus on health technologies at IMEC. So talk to me about how IMEC is advancing healthcare with the power of chip technology. It's true that IMEC is working on a, a whole range of technologies, chip-based technologies mostly, but for many different health applications. There's um, colleagues of mine working on implants, ingestibles, things that track your intestines, wearables, all kinds of life sciences products from cell sorting to the transfection of cells to reprogramming of cells on chip to whole organ on chips where we grow cells in structure to study them primarily and to study them, how they react to different kinds of drugs and so on. IMEC is a, of origin a silicon house, of course, which gives us the tools that few other researchers or developers in the life science, in the health industry have. We have the access to incredibly powerful features on an incredibly small scale, integrating electronics, photonics, fluidics, temperature control, and, and much more on very, very small footprints. And on top of that, it's not just that things can get smaller, but the designs we make are compatible with some of the most powerful manufacturing processes in the world. Think about all the components in, in your laptop, in your smartphone. If we would invent similar technologies on other platforms, the scaling process to bring these to a manufacturable scale would be an enormous effort, a risk, a cost, time. Whereas using these existing processes on silicon automatically eases the way to the scale up to get these to high numbers of production and thus to have much lower cost solutions in a foreseeable time, in a predictable time frame and a predictable cost. So, of course, if there are technologies out there that use a very simple plastic component, then there's no reason to do it with silicon. And then we will probably also not start doing it. But in many cases, we see that these complex features, these complex requirements to sort cells or, or to hold cells at a certain place or to rapidly capture the molecules of interest on a sensor actually do benefit from silicon technologies. Fantastic. All right, Bert, it's time for your off the cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there. What would you have? I do like Indian food. So maybe maybe I would like a curry or uh, something similar from one of the local Indian restaurants. Belgian style would mean that it's not too spicy, but yeah, something like that. I love it. I love Indian food as well. 
Well, there, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. If you would like even more information about this topic, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If LinkedIn is more your thing, you can follow me or us on LinkedIn. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon, too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me and our animated series called Libby's Lab. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of March 28th, 2025, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.